Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel Beth Chats Books. Now I've just got back from Essex last night where I went to visit Ben for my annual leave week off and I'm starting my new job this Monday so I haven't really had a chance to film anything or to go through any of the comments on my last video so I'm going to spend today kind of doing that and, and getting back into a bit of a routine. But I thought, you know, this video would kind of be a conglomeration of a lot of different things so I think I'm going to do some kind of recent reads and some newly acquired books and then I think I'm going to do some recent watches and recent favourites and just a little bit of kind of recent update all in one because I've not been reading as prolifically as I used to. I'm watching a lot of TV at the moment, obviously being at Ben's when he was at work I've been watching a lot of TV so I just thought that's really most of what I've been doing in the last week so that's what I should be catching up with you guys about. So I thought we'd try and be a little Christmassy and wear my Christmas jumper on this video but basically on the last two videos I tried to get the, the Christmas tree in the video but it, it's hard to explain but this is the end of the sofa and then it's in this corner so I kind of had it on a tilt and then I looked back and it kind of looked a bit stupid so uh. I would really love a kind of um, a chair, you know, kind of behind the tree. But this is my dad's house. We haven't really done much with it since I moved in and I don't feel confident tampering with things. And behind the tree we have a tiny little bookshelf that we managed to raggle out of my dad to set up. So I'm just kind of leaving it as it is um, and just going with it. So I should go through kind of what I've recently been reading. So I recently finished at Ben's Apple Tree Yard by Louise Doherty, or Doherty, I can't remember off the top of my head, and I'll insert a picture here. Now I left it at Ben's because I took a load of books to Ben's and I didn't really get to read as much as I would have liked because I got distracted by TV. But I left it there because my nana had given it to me and she'd really kind of strongly encouraged me to read it and then also to watch the series and because she really enjoyed both. So I thought I'll leave it there because she only gave it to me to read so if, if desperation comes to desperation and she actually wants it back I can always get it back when he next comes to visit me but then ended up buying some books from Oxfam so I just couldn't be bothered carrying that one back because I'd already finished it. I ended up giving the book 3.5 out of 5 stars. I enjoyed it because it was fast paced and I've currently recently been going through a bit of a reading lull. There's so many books I want to read but I kind of needed an easy read to get back into it because every time I was reading blurbs really intense stories were kind of coming out of the blurbs that I was reading and I was trying to read the first couple of pages and feeling a bit overwhelmed because I wasn't in that intense mood. So thrillers are always great I think as a kind of palate cleansing read. Now I don't love those kind of thrillers too much because once you've read one you tend to have read a lot of them and you can predict what's going to happen. And that one did have a few twists and turns but one thing I find a little bit tedious with thrillers and they keep using it as a kind of device, a technique and a, a trope is all these court scenes. The books start in a courtroom and then you go backwards through the past and then back to the court scene and find out what happens. Now when I recently watched The Cry that was set up in a very similar style where she was already in court and we didn't know what she was in court for and exactly the same trope was used in Apple Tree Yard. Now I enjoyed reading it while I was reading it. It was very fast paced, it's about 400 pages and I managed to read that in, in an afternoon so it was very easy to get through but it was problematic. I discussed it with boyfriend's mum when he was away at work um, because I'd finished watching the series. I basically read the book, watched the series then discussed it with her and I can't wait to discuss it with my nana because she's very opinionated about these things. But we both said that the female protagonist was very problematic and that made it very difficult to kind of sympathise with her and she was kind of delusional about the situation. So it follows a lady who is a scientist and she's fascinated by the genome and DNA and she ends up having an affair with some randomness she meets at one of her meetings that she has to go to for her job. She works at a really high institute in London, a scientific institute, and she meets him when she's gone to this meeting and they kind of have this very quick relationship, very sexually driven as well. And then some other things occur and then she ends up on trial potentially for murder. Now I'm not going to give much away because you, you should read it really if, if that intrigues you at all. But while I was reading it, it was enjoyable. Afterwards I kind of was like meh, it was just a palate cleansing 
read and unfortunately the series was uh, similar a lot of people have raved about the series so I, I wanted to watch it I think the acting was very well done I think it was a very faithful adaptation to the book however the same kind of issues that cropped up in the book for me also cropped up in the series which is a problematic protagonist and a kind of far-fetched plot but overall it kind of got me back into the groove of reading and it doesn't matter whether you read books that you kind of class yourself as a little lower brow or that your class is kind of guilty pleasure reads they help you get back to where you want to be now i'm not saying i don't like thrillers i love psychological very dark thriller-esque kind of style but the style that a lot of people find really popular at the moment and that's flying off the shelves and the supermarket shelves and the bookshops is these kind of gone girl style thrillers and they're the ones that i don't love the ones that are kind of like the couple next door, Gone Girl, Girl on the Train, those kind of things. I find them a bit tedious because the the plots for those thrillers are so structured and tropey that I tend to get a little bit bored after them and, and kind of find a predictable ending. There's only so many trope endings for them and they have very cliched endings. So I kind of tend to, to not go to them unless I'm kind of in a reading slump, for example. But I love ones like Lullaby and The Virgin Suicides, books that are kind of not really, that they're very dark, they can be about murders or suicide or very dark topics, but it isn't done in a tropey style. For example, Lullaby is a why done it, not who done it, so you know from the beginning that a murder has been committed and that the main protagonist is responsible, and we kind of go backwards. Um, to kind of find out why and I think that engages my my brain more I love kind of true crime and things like that because I love understanding why somebody's got to that position from a psychological perspective not from a psycho perspective I don't get off on that but you know that's my kind of where my passion lies but that was very rambly so I'm going to move on so what I've also started reading is Sherlock Holmes on audiobook now I've read the first two books A Study in Scarlet and the Sign of Four, I read them a while back, so basically I've got an audiobook, The Definitive Collection of Sherlock, and I kind of read it every so often then put it off because it is extensive. There's so many different parts that have all got about 13 and a half hours each, so I'm on kind of part three of The Definitive Collection, which is the short stories of Sherlock Holmes, which is the collection called The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Now I'm really enjoying that because it's only an hour per story sometimes 45 minutes so it's really nice to be able to just do them in little chunks and not feel overwhelmed and we're starting to get more of the characters of Sherlock and Watson through the first two books were very samey in my opinion um, but I'm kind of understanding that there's a lot of Sherlock information that's out in the, the the world that I haven't yet met in the collection so there's still a lot really to get through in terms of, of the Sherlock world but I love Stephen Fry's voice it's very soothing so at night I kind of put that on before I go to sleep and I kind of feel like I'm getting through that quite quite well and I'm really enjoying that so far it's nice around this time of year although Sherlock Holmes isn't predominantly Christmassy I kind of feel like he is and Stephen Fry has such a beautiful comforting cozy evening in kind of voice that I am feeling very festive just reading Sherlock, so it's nice. And then also, kind of going on a similar train of thought, I have started reading Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Now, I knew that I'd read The Order of the Phoenix recently, but then I realised it actually wasn't that recently. And it kind of made me think I needed to get back on this because I'm so close to the end, really. And then it's kind of pushed me to think maybe I could actually finish all of them before 2019. Um, so I read quite a lot at Ben's because Ben has the collection at his house. But this is mine. I didn't steal it. But it was very difficult on the train yesterday to have not wanted to, to pop his in my bag. But obviously it's a heavy hardback and I would have given him an incomplete collection at home. So I thought that was a little bit harsh. So no, this is my collection. I take the dust jacket off when I read it because it's just a lot easier. But I'm already 500 pages, so I've literally got the tiniest little chunk left because it's about 600 and something pages. Really enjoying this, it's such an easy read and I find Harry Potter a very comforting read around this time of year. A wintry read to snuggle up with, very nostalgic. A lot of it I'm quite happy with this particular book, that a lot of it I did remember. Whereas I kind of think because I haven't really read it since childhood, I forgot a lot, but I think the next book is the one where I've forgotten a lot. 
this one where we'd kind of start to get introduced to Horcruxes and um, we get a lot more character development from Tonks who was one of my favourites throughout the series and I was devastated by her and Lupin's death because they're kind of they were always my favourites that was the story line that I wanted a lot more of because it's introduced in here I think that's kind of sparked my interest but I basically decided to read this again because me and Ben and Ben's mum, they treated me this week while I was there at the beginning of the week to watch the new Fantastic Beast movie, The Crimes of Grindelwald or Grindelwald. I never know how to say it because everyone says it's slightly different. I'm just going to put this book down because it's quite heavy. And that was really interesting and it started to give it more of a backstory to who Grindelwald was and how he was kind of the first evil wizard before Voldemort and how everything kind of interlinks. And there's some very new and interesting information in this particular film. This film is not going to be as exciting as the first one because this is what I would call a filler film, which fills you with all the information so that the next one or maybe the next two, I don't know how many she's planning to make, are going to be the epic fight scenes, the epic crux of the story and, and getting us back onto the train of, of where we know where we're at with the world. So the first one did world building, a whole American Ministry of Magic and things like this, and this is your filler, this is all your information, this is your identity crisis, this is setting up the wider plot for the kind of conclusion and finale element. So it's more tedious in that sense if you're not interested in kind of filler storylines. And it's one of those films you walk away with with a lot more questions than answers. But I kind of liked that and I kind of liked that we're getting to a meat of a, of, of a story now. As with Harry Potter, it's the same kind of formula. You get learned to a false sense of security like you did a little bit with Fantastic Beasts with all these interesting um, animals like the Niffler and all these cutesy things. And then you kind of get to the, the raw bit of the story where things are going to kind of develop. So I actually really enjoyed it and I enjoyed it a lot more than the first one. Maybe because I'm a bit of a dark sinister person and I kind of like some meat to my story. But then it kind of made me think I need more answers from the Harry Potter world. So it encouraged me to get back to this. But I'm really enjoying this so far. I used to think the last couple of books weren't my favourite. As in I've always loved Prisoner of Azkaban and Goblet of Fire as, as up there. And Order of the Phoenix was always the one that I was slightly more bored by. Because that is definitely a filler book. But it, not a lot of action happens considering it is the biggest book in the collection. So there's bits that I liked about it like learning about the Order. There were other bits that I found kind of dragged out but this one has re sparked a lot of action and it's kind of the darker look at things now and Harry's starting to realise his importance in the in the wider plot and it's got a bit meatier so this is a really good companion after Order of the Phoenix I think because it kind of starts to go back to the things that we like about Harry Potter so I'm actually really really enjoying it and a lot more than I thought I would upon a reread I thought this one and the Deathly Hallows were going to be my least favourite but I'm pleasantly surprised and enjoying it. So I'll probably finish that today. And then I thought I would talk to you about some TV that I've been watching. So I have finished, I'm looking at my little list because I, I like keeping lists because I like having things visual for me to feel a sense of, of completion of these things. So I've got here that I have finished, I finished Sinner the other day, I did mention that previously on other videos so I won't dwell too much on that. The second series, like I said, in previous videos definitely wasn't as good as the first one. I really like the concept of Sinner, of kind of these really dark issues and I really like the very problematic detective and as I got to the end I appreciated more the character of the young boy in the second one and how he's been kind of he's grown up in this very strange culty environment and that's affected how he sees things and I loved at the end that they kind of didn't make him the easy scapegoat as, as a freak evil child that there was a lot more depth to that however the whole culty environment was very long drawn out for me and I wasn't as engaged and, and passionate about wanting to know what happened in the end because the second one kind of goes more fragmentary whereas the first one was it was kind of a rush to find out what happens right at the end but I did enjoy it not my favorite though then I have just momentarily talked about Apple Tree Yard as well. Don't dwell too much on that because it wasn't the most exciting thing that I've watched this kind of this year or this month in particular. But Apple Tree Yard filled a hole. It was only four episodes long. Found it on Prime, and that's how I watched it. If anybody in the UK wants to watch that, but then the highlight. I've watched a lot of TV, but I feel like I should save it because 
they're not fully completed yet so I've been watching Clique but I think there's at least one more episode to go on that one. I've been watching David Attenborough's Dynasties but I'm pretty sure there's another one at least coming out and I kind of want to re-watch the Painted Dogs episode because my brother and sister got really angry at me and said that was the best one in the series, how can you say it wasn't? But I was reading Harry Potter at the same time as watching it so I feel like then I can give it more time and some other bits like I'm trying to catch up with Killing Eve and I'm still trying to start Haunting of Hill House and things like that so I feel like I should talk about them later so I'm just gonna scoot that on over for another time but one that I have completed and absolutely loved was Mrs Wilson so this is currently on BBC iPlayer and it's only three episodes so I would highly highly recommend you go and watch it so it's based on true events so what's fascinating is Ruth Wilson is actually playing her real life grandma's storyline which is fascinating. So basically her grandma set up a life with her husband and had two children and had this happily ever after storyline and then her husband dies and it appears that she has found out a lot of secrets about her husband. So she believed her husband worked in the secret service and that was kind of all she knew. She was kind of keeping all of his secrets. Turns out he had a lot more skeletons in the closet including maybe the fact she wasn't his only wife so that's not a spoiler because really in the first five minutes of the program you you find that out but I'm not going to spoil anymore because it kind of takes you on a wild journey you wouldn't believe it if it wasn't true it's one of those stories that if someone had gone to a producer and said we're going to go with the storyline they would have said oh it's a bit far-fetched that we can't really make that believable but it is absolutely true and the last episode was fantastic because it kind of shows the real life impact so it does a bit of a montage at the end where it kind of shows a reunion and that's all I shall say but I thought the story was fascinating Ruth played her grandma's character really well I really loved about it as well is that it's so easy to demonize the husband when the kind of infidelity comes out and the program worked really hard to not demonize him there was so much that you could still gain from him and you kind of left the series with questions and a little fondness for him at the same time it's very warped to say that but he is an enigmatic figure and he is the everyday person with an extraordinary story and I think that's what resonates with so many people watching it. It was absolutely fantastic. Five out of five stars for me as a series. I absolutely loved that. Um, it's just pure escapism but it also was linked to a wider narrative through our, our history and what connects us and the fact it does talk quite openly as well about how he suffered from the First World War and how he kind of had a lot of shock and mental health issues that weren't addressed as well. So it does encompass a wider narrative and, and it's just fantastic. And I would highly recommend watch that now. Apple Tree Yard, the series, I'll probably just give a three out of five if I have to give a rating. And Sinner, similar, 3.5. It wasn't great, whereas the first one was definitely more like a 4.5. But that's all of the kind of TV books things because I don't want to overwhelm you guys because it's going to be exceptionally long but just give me one second and I will just come and show you the little recent purchases that I got from Oxfam while I was down in Essex. Sorry about that. So the first one I want to show you is John Wyndham's Chucky. I think that's how you say it. Now I recently watched a video from the channel Books and Quills, Sarah from Books and Quills and I'll link it down below in which her and a friend kind of went through a series of books that they had to read at university doing an English degree but that they ended up loving and really kind of set them on the way to find out what they really enjoy. Now they mentioned John Wyndham's Day of the Triffids which is his, one of his most famous books and while I was in Oxfam I did try to find that one and, that, and there's another one kind of about a group of children, I've forgotten the name of that one that's also really famous. But I found Chucky instead. Now this seems to be a book that was fated for me to read first of John Wyndham's because every time I've ever gone into a bookshop or I've gone to an Oxfam or a secondhand bookshop, Chucky's all I find. So I found it and I thought, well, the way they talked about John Wyndham, he sounds like someone I could really enjoy because it has that kind of creepy, unsettling vibe that based on other books that I've thoroughly loved, like The Virgin Suicides, name dropping, 
and Rebecca, atmospheric, kind of creepy, and I think he would be a very interesting character because if I like his style, he could really be a stepping stone for me to get more into science fiction works because he does like the abnormal and the science fiction, but everyone that has read John Wyndham has always commented on what a what an impact he's had on modern kind of cinema, modern sci-fi. I think he would write very well atmosphere and the kind of uncanny and things like that which I've really enjoyed in other people's works. So this is about a little boy who they think he's got kind of abnormal behaviour. He starts to behave in a very weird way and have conversations with himself, with himself and they're a little bit worried and then they discover that he can do very strange things like it says on the back here binary code mathematics and he's a young boy and it's because there is a little person who lives inside his head called Chucky who is starting to kind of take over him and make him do certain things so it sounds very unnerving and eerie and really really interesting and something that I think I will really enjoy it's very short as well I think it's under 200 pages um, yeah, it's 150, so I feel like it will be so easy to get into a day's sitting and it will be a great way to get into more Wyndham works. So there's that one. And then the next one I picked up because I've been looking for this forever and I didn't want to pay full price for it. And that is Gabriela Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude. Now, last year or the beginning of this year, I can't remember because years just melt for me, I read his book love in the time of cholera and I surprisingly loved it. I thought it was just going to be a meth book but I loved that it was slow and it was about the characters and there was a lot of things and references in it I didn't necessarily understand but I loved it. So I really want to see if I'll enjoy this one because a lot of people actually say they preferred this one. So I kind of really wanted to see how I'd feel about it and also I thought this was a very pretty cover. I've seen some very pretty covers of other books but I've never really seen this one it's it's very unique I haven't seen this cover around and the back's kind of it's got a price tag on it but it's kind of got this purpley kind of flower at the back so I don't know literally anything about it but I really wanted to read it and see how I would feel now this font is absolutely tiny and it seems to be quite chunky I think it is 400 odd pages I know from reading the last one that he tends to have a slow writing style so we'll see when I get to it but I saw it and it was £2.50 and I thought I might as well get it because I know it is something on my list to achieve so there's that one. And then the final one was kind of a random whim buy and that is Philip Larkin's A Girl in Winter. Now random little fact Philip Larkin was the librarian at Hull University which my mum went to but I'm not entirely sure if he was a librarian when she was there. She didn't know that much about him, but he seems to be one of these people that I vividly remember now because when I took an English exam, many, many moons ago now, I got him, Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath a little bit mixed up in my head and I made a fundamental error um, between them and now they kind of all haunt me because I cannot forget them. And it's because I did a lot of work on Philip Larkin at the time and and then Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes but <laughs> bizarrely I seem to think that Sylvia Plath and Philip Larkin were together which is not the case it was Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath but now it's one of he's one of those people that haunts me and I'm oddly fascinated by it. now I thought he was predominantly a poet because we worked and did a lot of work on his poetry but this is a novel and apparently he has written a few of them so that made me very fascinated because I thought I've never really touched Larkin since school and maybe well college and maybe this could be something quite interesting and the blurb sounded really interesting to me so I will read it to you. So this story of Catherine Lind and Robin Fennell of winter and summer of war and peace of exile and holidays is memorable for its compassionate precision and for the uncommon and un unmistakable distinction of its writing. So it sounds very interesting and this is his second novel. So the cover intrigued me. I was a little bit like, what? what is the deeper plot to this? So I just thought, wow, this is also 250. I might as well try it if I don't like it, don't like it, but then at least I've tried to get into Larkin a little bit more. So there's that one. So I'm going to wrap it up here because it's kind of got a little bit out of hand, this, this video. But I just want to thank you guys so much for watching this video. Please hit the subscribe button if you want to be alerted for when any of my future videos come out. And I will be back very soon with another video.
Bye now.